Good morning and good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Lyft TV. I'm Sandeep Chuneja and I head market access at TV Alliance. On behalf of the Alliance and Lyft TV partners, I'm grateful that you're taking time off from your busy schedule during the union conference. It's especially difficult uh, these days when you are on uh, conferences and Zoom calls throughout the day. Uh, and I'm glad you're taking the time to learn about this new initiative that we are introducing today. It will help speed up availability of novel TB treatments, starting with those for the most highly resistant forms of the disease. Over the course of this hour, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function in the webinar or email them to communications at tvalliance.org. Our moderator, who you'll meet soon, Dr. Saurabh Rane, will raise these questions with the panelists during the closing Q&A session. Today, you'll hear from Dr. Tiak Khun Lee uh, of the Global Disease Eradication Fund of uh, Korea, followed by two WHO regional programs and three national TB program representatives from the Philippines, Ukraine, and Myanmar. But first, I'd like to provide you with an overview of Lift TB that we are unveiling today. LIFT TB stands for Leveraging Innovation for Faster Treatment of Tuberculosis. And I'll explain to you what we are doing very briefly, uh, but this being just a one hour meeting, I'll be brief. We'll be happy to take any questions, clarifications after the meeting, uh, feel free to send them to us. Uh, LIFT TB, the project aims to accelerate implementation of short regimens for drug-resistant TB, starting with the BPAL regimen, and in the process, increase treatment completion rates and ensure that those successes of the project are sustained. All this in line with global policy and guidelines. The project will focus on seven countries, namely Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, Myanmar, Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. I'm delighted to share with you that Republic of Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Global Disease Eradication Fund have decided to fund Lift TB through Korea International Cooperation Agency or COICA. We are grateful for COICA's support to BPAL and the field of TB in general, especially at this crucial juncture when the world is going through a major economic crisis. TB Alliance is co-funding this project through generous support of governments of UK and Australia, among many others who support our efforts. Today, we'll be listening to perspectives from some of the Lift TB participating countries. We couldn't get all seven countries to participate because of time constraints. Uh, however, I'm sure there'll be possibilities in the future for wider interaction with all project partners and countries. This slide represents the core rationale for Lift TB. The chart on the left represents success rates of MDR and XDR TB treatments. You can see they are low. They've been inching up off late, but they remain low, as low as 43%. Uptake of novel drugs could have improved these rates. However, that has taken very long. And this is illustrated in the graphic on the right. For novel TB therapeutics approved in the last few years, it's taken one to four years to get the first approval after a stringent regulatory approval and nearly two years for countries to commence procurement. This indicates that precious time is lost between the first SRA approval and availability of drugs, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. Hence, efforts to catalyze accelerated transition are crucial for newer regimens. And this is the catalytic support that Lift TB aims to provide, uh, which will help faster and smoother transition to the BPAL regimen to start with. And towards this, the project will support early start of operations research for BPAL, consistent with WHO guidelines that were published earlier this year. And it'll support data collection and reporting from those on an ongoing basis to add to global evidence base and help development of treatment policy speedily. It'll help capacity building for the use of new regimens scale up and in-country availability and sustainability through integration into budgets and grants. 
An example of speed is that project countries are already planning for operational research for BPAL, and most are expected to commence patient enrollments by end of this year or early next year. That is within a few months from WHO guidelines uh, recommending operations research in June. Uh, importantly, LIFT TV will also seek to disseminate its experience, tools, and, in, and experience uh, regionally and globally. Thus, the project will not only help these seven countries that are part of the project, but also help the field of TB in general get future ready to implement newer regimens efficiently. That's our hope that we will be able to use this as a catalyst, as an example, to speed up transition to newer drugs to, for TB in the future. Key to this project to lift TB is partnerships. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce key project partners to you. The, the primary collaborator for Lift TB for TB Alliance is the Korea-based nonprofit International Tuberculosis Research Center or ITRC in short. ITRC will be responsible for project in two countries and is responsible for lab system strengthening as well. KNCV is a key technical partner to the project and will be responsible for the project in five countries and will provide technical support to others. Mylan is TB Alliance's global commercialization partner and has prioritized regulatory submissions in these countries. In fact, regulatory uh, prog progress of regulatory submissions has is, is been uh, very fast and we expect close to 30 submissions to have happened by the end of this year or early next. It is important to note that the project doesn't intend to work in isolation. Uh, it will work closely with global stakeholders and coordinate with them and ensure that the work is, is the project's work complements their work. And that'll include uh, the World Health Organization, Global Fund, GDF, and many others. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues from ITRC, KNCV, and the Alliance who have worked hard to make this initiative come together. And I look forward to all of us working together. And finally, a note of acknowledgement to our donors whose support makes it possible for us to carry out this work, including this project. And I'm thrilled we are adding our Korean donors to this list today. With that, please welcome Mr. Tia Kuan Lee, uh, who will speak to the Republic of Korea's efforts to fight TB and meet global goals. Mr. Lee was appointed as the Director General of the Global Disease Eradication Fund in 2019. He joined COICA in 2004 and managed various development projects and programs in health and climate change sectors. From 2019 to 2015 to 2019, he served as country director of COICA in Guatemala. He's obtained his MA degree in international commerce in Seoul, Korea. Mr. Lee, over to you. Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Lee. I'm the director of Global Disease Eradication Fund. I'm pleased to speaking with all of you today. Uh, before presenting Korea's participation in the LIFT TV program, uh, let me first give you a brief introduction to, to the Global Disease Eradication Fund. Um, back in uh, 2007, in an attempt to uh, join global efforts to seek out innovative sources of development financing, uh, the Korean government decided to apply air ticket contribution. Around one US dollar is imposed on each international flight passenger and in 2019 alone, the amount of the revenue collected reached 35 million US dollars and is expected to grow, is, it, is expected to continue growing once the COVID-19 pandemic subsides. Uh, the next uh, slide shows the major uh, channels of delivery of the fund. Say, um, Around 51% of, of total assistance is channeled for specific projects implemented by multilateral organizations, while 39% of assistance is allocated as um, core contributions 
to multilateral organizations. Uh, the share of assistance uh, channeled uh, through CSOs uh, remains around at uh, 10%. The next, okay. In terms of geographical distribution of aid, uh, the fund's assistance has been focused on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to date. However, along with the launch of Lift TB, uh, support has been extended to the Eurasian region and the share of assistance to Asian countries will continue to increase in line with the government policy. Now, let me briefly present the fund's strategic framework. GDEF envisions a leading role of the fund in the global fight against infectious diseases. To achieve this goal, uh, first it promotes global health security uh, by preventing, detecting, and responding to infectious diseases. Uh, second, uh, the fund supports uh, various activities to control uh, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Third, uh, the fund also uh, supports uh, knowledge management and the partnerships with the CSOs. Lastly, I'd like to go over the background to the collaboration with TB Alliance. Since uh, 2019, um, the fund has been exploring new models of collaboration with product uh, development partnerships uh, to distinguish from uh, regular ODA budgets. Through communications with the International Tuberculosis Research Center uh, based in Korea, we have noticed that the recent advances in diagnostics and treatment for drug resistant TB and we found out TB Alliance, TB Alliance was behind the research and innovation. Lift TB program is the first uh, example where the Korean government uh, works with a PDP to promote innovative health solutions. Where at this time when COVID-19 is intensifying global inequalities, I hope Lift TB program will catalyze the Korean government's increased investment in advanced health technologies in the future. Thank you. Mr. Lee, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, as we transition to our regional and national speakers, uh, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Saurabh Rani. Uh, Saurabh is a healthcare innovation specialist and an XTR TB survivor. He believes in action-led advocacy and despite suffering permanent lung damage due to his uh, long treatment of TB, he continues to run marathons, climb high altitude mountains to inspire patients and raise awareness around TB. Saurabh, we need more like you and we are honored to have you with us. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sandeep. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, we're all going through tough times right now. Um, but you know, we're all in the same storm, but we aren't in the same boat. And I cannot put in words what TB patients are going through right now. But the pandemic uh, has not caused this breakdown, right? It's merely made it worse. Um, I can dial back to 2013, when it took six months for me to get the right diagnosis. And I come from the medical background. And then it took me nearly three years to finish my XTR TB treatment. But what's really unacceptable is that uh, you know, despite physicians throwing all sorts of combination at XTR TB, for over 60% of these patients, um, everything fails. And that too after an excruciating two to three years of battling with the disease, right? So one thing for sure, time is not a luxury either for the patient or the physician. And hence, I think I'm super excited that now we have an effective regime, which has a very high success rate, somewhere around 90%, against like toughest form of TB that we've seen. But we really need to get this to the patients at the earliest and, you know, goes without saying, of course, keeping the scientific evidence and safety in mind. While it's super heartening to see that, you know, projects like Lift TV will get our patients reaches on VPAL in several countries, uh, what's really impressive over here is the speed with which this is done. Um, six months uh, from the WHO guidelines being issued and in the middle of COVID-19, 
we are here. So I'm really glad that some patients will begin to get access to this regime very soon. Having said that, um, what will make me and other patients and survivors really happy is when this regime is used, you know, programmatically and sort of reaches everyone who needs it worldwide and not just seven countries through Lift TB. But it's but it's a start. And I do believe that many of the speakers today and those in the audience also have the ability to sort of speed up the process and get these new uh, medicines to the patients at the earliest. So let me just jump into it. Today, we are really glad to have the WHO and country representatives from affected regions. Um, they and others like them will be leading the fight against DRTV in the field. And I really look forward to sort of hearing from them regarding their plans for implementation for new therapies like, like PPAL. For this, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Tawhid Islam, who is the WHO Western Pacific Region Coordinator for TB and Leprosy. He is a public health expert who has worked in the TB field for almost two decades across different countries. Um, he helped set up the Western Pacific RGLC to scale up the programmatic management of drug resistant tuberculosis. Dr. Islam is currently traveling and he has graciously submitted a pre-recorded video, but he will be available for the live Q&A. So welcome Dr. Islam, and we we'll look forward to your insights on the state of DRTB treatment in your region, as well as the readiness to implement new regimes, just like that. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share the perspective of Western Pacific region. I would like to start by giving the context of our region. The region bears almost one fifth of global TB burden and also one fifth of drug resistant tuberculosis burden. As per 2020 global TB report, in 2019, there were estimated 1.8 million new TB cases, 90,000 deaths due to TB, and more than 100,000 rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. Since 2000, 23 million have been successfully treated and 14 million lives have been saved across the region. Compared to 2015, 17% reduction in death and 6% reduction in incidence. Despite all the progress we have, so much more to do to end tuberculosis. The progress is too slow to reach the end TB and sustainable development goal time in my intervention. Firstly, patient centeredness is the central theme of end TB strategy. We must keep patient in the center of our plan, action, and what we do. Let's look at the cascade of drug-resistant TB in the region. 70% of the estimated cases are not detected or notified. Those who are notified, 20% of them missed the treatment, 40% of them had unfavorable outcomes. We need to understand each step from the patient's perspective. We need the culture of operational research to address those practical concerns. We may need TB service close to the patient with diagnostic facilities, using patient-friendly, shorter, and effective treatment regimen. We need patient support service. We all know this, but the hardest part to develop such system to deliver this, which needs strong political commitment. Secondly, innovation and rapid rollout is the key to success in TB control. We know the limitation of our current tools in diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. We know the pipelines too. Development of new tools such as diagnostic, novel treatment regimen, or vaccine are important, and similarly important, the plan for implementation at the field level. We know that any changes are difficult and takes time. We need to prepare ourselves to rapidly roll out new tools. We need to prepare ourselves 
for the future. I believe this Lift TV project will contribute in readiness of rolling out new tools for the future. Finally, global community is facing unprecedented challenge at the moment. COVID-19 is testing all our health system while putting the greatest strain on the most vulnerable. In case of TB, this is drug resistant TB. Therefore, reaching this unreached group has never been more important. Now this is the time to think innovatively how we do this or else the progress we have over the past decades may be lost. 25% decrease in case detection over for six months of 2020 in the region may contribute excess TB death of 80,000, bringing death due to TB at the level of early 2000. If we do not take actions now, we may lose all of our previous effort. However, this is also an opportunity to reset our priority, find innovative solutions, such as introduction of shorter all oral regimen. We need global solidarity and partnership more than ever before. Together, we can end TB. I wish all the success of this Lift TB project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Islam, for giving us a comprehensive picture of various activities that will ensure the best possible treatments should, to reach the best possible patients and the ones who need it the most. I think I love the part about patient-centric care. I think that's the core of how we should be looking at this disease and look at patients as humans. And on this note, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Vineet Bhatia who is a medical officer in the TB unit at WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. He is a focal point for drug resistant TB and also a part of the RGLC. He has over 20 years of experience with TB programs spanning multiple regions and countries. Dr. Bhatia, we are looking forward to your insights on the status of DRTB treatment in Southeast Asia and the role of new therapies like BPAL in the system especially given the heat caused by this combined heavy burden of DRTB and COVID-19. Thanks, Saurabh. And uh, thanks to TB Alliance for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the WHO Southeast Asia region. For some of you who may not be completely aware, quickly, Southeast Asia region is a combination of 11 countries. Uh, which include Bangladesh, Bhutan, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, India, Indonesia, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and uh, Timor Leste. So this is a region which has like 26% of the global population, roughly, uh, but uh, accounts for 43% of the TB incidents as per the global 2020 report. As far as the MDRTB is concerned, uh, there was uh, around 171,000 uh, uh, MDRTB cases, uh, rifampicin resistant and MDRTB cases appearing in the region out of 465,000 globally. So which means that this region also has more than one third of the MDRTB burden. Now, once we have uh, talked about the burden where are we with the progress towards reaching out to the people who need the services most? Uh, and uh, I'll just like to remind people that uh, in the UN high level meeting, which was held in 2018, all member states committed to reach a target of about 1.5 million, uh, not just reach out, successfully treat 1.5 million drug resistant TB cases by 2022 which means for our region, which bears more than 30%, it has to be more than half a million MDRTB cases. And uh, if you look at our progress till now, between 2018 and 19, there were about uh, 125,000 MDRTB cases put on treatment with a treatment success rate for the 2017 cohort of about 52%. 
Now, putting things in perspective, we have already covered 40% of the time and just enrolled 25% of our targets in the region. And remember, I'm just saying 25% of the targeted enrollment. I'm not talking about successful treatment. So if we add successful treatment, then we are just at 13% of the target with a 52% treatment success rate. So there is a sense of urgency. And as Saurabh also said, uh, we need to reach out to the patients fast with good services and good treatment. And of course, uh, the previous speakers, uh, including Dr. Tohid, has uh, uh, alluded to the current challenging situation where COVID is hampering our outreach efforts. Uh, the challenges, of course, are obvious. Uh, the case finding has been low. Uh, our first line DST figures, which are, if, if, if you look at the percentages, it about 65% of new uh, cases in 2019 and about 82% of retreatment cases. But again, if you look at what is missed out of all those TB cases put on treatment, we could not offer a drug susceptibility uh, testing to more than a million TB cases. So that's the situation now. And remember amongst all these cases, we haven't yet quantified the human suffering. We've heard sort of how difficult it is to pass through an XTR TB treatment. And you know, all these figures remind us of the fact that you know there are millions who are undergoing the agony of XTR TB treatment with a regimen which are like suboptimal, which are toxic, which lead to a lot of suffering and sometimes more suffering than the disease itself. Uh, so we need to, in our region, uh, expand the drug susceptibility uh, treatment fast. But then if we go back to the um, treatment success rate, which again is, I would say, not less than frustrating, 52%, and it has been around this level for past three or four years, uh, we certainly need to have a people-centered approach. Now, what people-centered approach would mean that having this treatment closer to the patients, monitoring for adverse events, and more than anything else, have a safe, short, affordable treatment regimen that can be easily administered. Uh, as we just know that uh, we're talking about the difficulties during COVID, our health system, which was weak, and as was just said, the cracks were rather exposed by COVID-19. It's not that uh, we had a strong health system which was broken by COVID-19. It was just that the weaknesses are exposed and clear uh, in front of us. It's not possible from the health system's point of view to administer long regimen, ensure uh, management of all treatment adverse events, and specifically the regimen which contain daily injections. It's, it's simply impossible, and now COVID has exposed it to administer such type of regimen to patients and causing additional suffering, which when we have newer tools and newer drugs uh, becomes meaningless and rather criminal, I would say, to give a, a regimen which is not uh, optimal. So uh, an all oral regimen, which is shorter, which has lesser drugs, which has uh, lesser side effects, is certainly an added advantage and uh, a tool in our arsenal in fight against the extreme forms of drug resistant TB. Uh, our region uh, so far since uh, July when the new uh, uh, guidelines were released has been working on uh, capacity building, uh, dissemination of the guidelines. We have had several webinars uh, one was, in fact, in uh, collaboration with TB Alliance, where they also shared uh, what is going on in the clinical trials that they are conducting. And this like invited a lot of interest in the region. And of course, we are working with the countries, each country by country, to see how we can promote operational research on these newer regimen so that these are available quickly. They are available um, at an early date to all those who need these regimen. 
So thank you from my side and uh, back to you, Saurabh. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia, for you know, shedding light on some grave issues faced by high load countries and sort of the need of moving fast and you know, putting all hands on deck to get the best possible services to these patients who need it right now. And this also tells us why it's important for countries to set up and take charge, right? Um, and just one quick thing for our audience over here, I see a couple of raised hands. Um, for any questions, you could use the Q&A option and some of your questions there so we can make note of it. Thank you for that. Um, moving on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Celine Garfi, who is the NTP manager in the Philippines. Um, Dr. Garfi, we look forward to hearing from you how the Philippines is dealing with DRTB and also crafting plans to get new regimes uh, you know, to their patients. So hello, everyone. A good day to all. So the Philippines started to address the burden of drug resistance TB as early as 1999 in the private sector by the Tropical Disease Foundation in one facility at the National Capital Region. Nine years later, the Department of Health through the National TB Control Program accepted the responsibility for expanding the services to drug resistant TB nationwide. So today, Almost 21 years later, the services are available nationwide. The number of DRTB cases placed on treatment has increased from less than 100 per year before to 6,349 cases in 2019. Sadly, of these cases, 82 have extensive drug-resistant tuberculosis. Despite this progress, we continue to have low case notification of drug-resistant TB and that is 31% in 2019, and low treatment success rate at 65% for the 2018 cohort of patients. And the treatment success rate among the 2016 cohort of XDRTB is only 20%. So this is something that we should address immediately. One of the reasons for the low treatment success rate of patients on DRTB treatment is the long duration of treatment of 18 to 24 months. In 2015, we introduced the nine-month treatment regimen through an operational research mode, and the treatment success rate was 74%, and this paved the way for the adoption of the standard short all-oral regimen for drug-resistant drug TB in 2017. The conduct of the operational research capacitated the program to adapt new treatment regimens. It has also made us confident and knowledgeable on what measures to take in introducing new regimens. The COVID-19 experience also helped us realize that short all oral regimens will facilitate the provision of patient-centered care. So the patients do not have to go to the health facility daily because they do not have injections. So we aim to use new regimens to ensure that we provide patient-centered care to our patients. As such, shorter regimens like BPAL will support the target to move towards that direction. We are looking forward to the implementation of BPAL in the country with support from the COICA TB Alliance, LIFT TB Project, and Technical Partnership with ITRC and KNCV. It is an honor for us to be part of the study. We plan to implement the BPAL study in 12 study sites and to enroll 100 patients over a period of two years. This study will help us generate evidence that is needed if we have to adapt new technology, new treatment regimens as part of the requirement of health technology assessment under the newly signed Universal Healthcare Act. We always consider TA provided to the country as an opportunity for us to learn and help us prepare to future undertakings in adoption of novel treatment regimens and innovations, especially during this time where there is always something new for the program to implement. For the past five years, we have several changes in our policies. 
it's almost every two years or even less. But we do not mind as long as we have the evidence, we have the capacity, and we have put in place safety measures to ensure that our patients are provided with quality TB care. So we look forward for this project to further enhance our capacity to implement and scale up new regimens like BIPAL in the country. We look forward to contributing evidence to support the wider rollout of the regimen worldwide. Any change that we do in the program does not come without challenges, but we would always take the risk for what is important is that we take the opportunity to change the lives of our TB patient for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Garfin, for you know, walking us through the efforts that the NTP is taking to tackle DRTB and the thought process of implementing new regimes. Um, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Natalia Litmenko. She is the head of DRTB research at the National Institute of TB and Lung Diseases, Ukraine, and the principal investigator for BPAL OR in Ukraine. Dr. Natalia, I understand that Ukraine has support from both uh, TB Reach and Lift TB for BPAL implementation in your country. So Ukraine has certainly established itself as a leader in providing access to new therapies, which definitely gives hope to patients. And you know, we would love to hear your perspective and plans for DRTB in the Ukraine. Yes, thank you uh, for introduce and uh, uh, about Ukraine. Ukraine is the one of the most responsive countries regarding in the RTB budget. The country accounts for less than 3% of global and RTB incidents, but only five of those in treatment. Close to 60% of MDRTB patients is in the country received treatment in 2018, but global average is only uh, 30%. Ukraine treated close to 1,500 uh, people for XDRTB, which account for almost 13% uh, for XDRTB cases treated worldwide. Despite these efforts, treatment success rates remain very low. Only uh, 49 persons for, uh, person for MDR and uh, 37 persons for MDR TB patients. And the main reason of this is to lack of availability of short, easy or to use and highly effective treatments. Besides, a high proportion of the RTB case places a great burden on the TB program budget. Uh, for example, anti-tuberculosis drugs are domestically funded in Ukraine. And uh, after that, let me introduce the main information about implementation uh, short treatment regimen in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has begun a move to short uh, MDRTB regimen since uh, 2016. First, uh, 200 patients started shorter regimens under OR conditions based on our clinic at the National TB Institute since uh, 2016. And more than 50 persons of patients from all regions were on shorter treatment in uh, 2019. But patients with pre and XDRTB did not have access to short regimens and were forced to receive only longer regimen. Uh, so, uh, which support from the recent TB Reach grant and no TB Alliance uh, project Lift TB, Ukraine is among the first few countries to kickstart the introduction of the VAL um, under our conditions uh, according to the latest WHO guidelines. So um, the main detail is about the PAL introduction in uh, operational research condition, especially in Ukraine. Uh, the first uh, 135 patients will be enrolled in Ukraine since uh, 2020 to be PAL. Uh, first, uh, uh, patients will be started, uh, started to treatment at the end of October 2020. Um, the main information, uh, 
uh, three first patients have screening now uh, and uh, may be enrolled at the end on this week to be followed uh, in our uh, clinic. There is one site for treatment in our operational research. It's uh, uh, MDR-TB clinic at the National TB Institute, but uh, it's a site for patients from eight regions from Ukraine. Our plan of scale up of BIPAL is to share to BIPAL for all regions, regions of Ukraine in 2022. Uh, my benefit for Ukraine from the OASC and CV to be Alliance International Technical Assistance is to receive yourself experience about effectiveness, safety, and tolerability in new short innovation, innovative BIPAL regimen. And the conclusions uh, Ukraine planning to increase the number of patients using second treatment, uh, short treatment regimen, including BIPAL. Uh, over the next third years to more than in uh, 50 persons of patients, more than. Uh, a regimen like the PAL firsts with Ukraine strategic detection of the moving to shorter regimens. Uh, besides, simple regimen like BIPAL, uh, BIPAL can decrease additional pressure of TB care facilities due to COVID-19 because it is the shorter all oral treatment regimen oriented firstly in ambulatory care. And uh, 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 end of my presentation, we may to say for other countries for adapt innovations. Uh, one message, BIPAL is a friendly, a human-oriented approach for treatment with high efficacy and low level of toxicity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Natalia, for sharing these insights around DRTB and the value that new drug regimens would sort of bring to the patients. I think this just reaffirms the fact that we need to move fast and we need to do it together. And uh, you know, you can confirm that OR for BPAL is sort of being undertaken under WHO guidelines um, as thanks to Dr. Natalia's input. Um, our last speaker for today is Dr. Zom Min, who is a senior consultant uh, with NTB Myanmar. He is a public health expert with two decades of experience in the field of TB and he has been a part of various studies for TB management in Myanmar. Uh, Dr. Min, it is impressive to see Myanmar being amongst the leaders in implementing modern TB care by planning for BPAL, and we are very keen to listen to your plans. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, regarding about the, the MDR TB management in Myanmar, it started in 2009 and 10, more than the, the uh, 15 uh -huh. thousand cases of the the MDR TB patient are now only in having enrolled in our number. Uh, another one is, is, is the, regarding about the use of the new drugs. Since the 2016, we have been collaborated with the MSF and SSD NTP project. We started to use the, the bedagoline delaminate and a little with the, the combination of the drugs to recommended by the WHO background regime since the 2016, so that we have experienced the use of their, their new drugs and also. Uh, another one is uh, since the 2017, we have to follow the the bridge or, or guided is the, the injection shorter causes. And since the, the 2017, we have to treated more than uh, 1,100 patients of with the shorter regime, and we had experienced this, such a kind of the, the shorter regime and the new drugs uh, diagnosis. The treatment of gan result is more than 2017 cohort. The MDRV treatments is already the, the, the 80 percent. And then the shorter injection treatment causes is the, the, the 86 percent. And the NDB projects, the treatment is rate of the, the exterior and the pre-exterior patient is 60 percent, uh, 60 percent of the, the patients is now we catch because of the such a kind of the high treatment is rate for a DRDB treatment are the, the, uh, the low or loss to follow up cases and stronger target of the treatments and, uh, and the community based on the DRDB care. And then finally, regarding on the BIPA regime, 
And then and the review of the NIST TV study, we, we, we know that that's 90 percent of the uh, the the HDRDV patient have the trimly succeeded. Uh, that that this kind of the the, the shoulder goes as affordable regions we would like to get for the our the the the, the admission that people program because of the uh, the low duration, less causes and and the less side effects. And then it is lead to the the increased the, the, the patient preferences and loss to follow up with this. Another one, another one is after the 2023, there is the reduced amount of glutathione. We only depend on the, 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 our domestic uh, sources, such a kind of the condition that we are followed to uh, use the such a kind of shorter and less uh, laser side effect and affordable regime for our country. Now that we regarding about the people regime, now the, the, the uh, operational resources and the, the, the protocol is now finalized in, and we are submitted to the, our ethical board uh, after a while because of the COVID-19. Now it's a little bit pandy. After that, in the new near future, we will own the 50 patient for the 2020, uh, the 150 patient for the 2021, and some 50 patient for the 2022, and 175 patient for the 2023 with the and support. That's a kind of the shorter treatment Affordable regime is very effective for the, our, our program, and it is maybe more effective for the HDR depression all over the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Mint. We are excited to see the progress and pace that the NTP has showcased and. We're really looking forward to seeing how the implementation of VPAT changes patients' lives at the earliest. Uh, with this, I would now like to take the questions from the audience. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to pick maybe one or two questions, but um, I would urge any of you to uh, send their questions at communications at tvalliance.org and you would get them answered. Um, I see that we have Dr. Askar from the WHO Euro region here and I would like to begin today's Q&A session by asking him the first question. Um, you know, there are, there are three countries uh, from the WHO Euro region in this project, right? Uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. What role can you play uh, sort of to increase the country? That's really some of the bigger high burden ones in your region to start uh, you know, implementing new regimes, say like the BPAP. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. and. Uh, um, I would say that I represented the WHO European region, and our region is experiencing high burden of drug-resistant tuberculosis with uh, 70,000 MDRTB uh, new cases every year. So um, actually, the, um, the, the global laboratory confirmed XDRTB is currently more than 12,000 cases, and out of which like more than 8,500 are in the, our region in WHO Euro. And uh, out of those 12,000 uh, XDRTB cases, uh, who, patients who started treatment, uh, and 9.8, almost 10,000 are from our region. So uh, we are very much, and the treatment success is still low, it's 6, 59%, and for XDRTB is uh, below 40. So that is why we definitely need the effective, safe, and shorter treatment regimen for both MDRTB and fluorocanolone resistant tuberculosis. And that is why I would say that this is a very good momentum to use the best global knowledge to, uh, to scale up access to these innovations. So I would say that in the WHO European region, we're implementing the regional operational research and introduction of fully oral modified shorter treatment regimens for MDRTB in order to improve both treatment success, generate the good quality evidence on effectiveness and safety of new regimens for MDRTB and provide the background for the future guideline development groups on the uh, on the next round of uh, recommendations for MDRTB. We have 18 high priority countries for tuberculosis in the region and so far out of those 18, 14 countries joined the uh, initiative on the uh, operational research for modified regimens all oral uh, and shorter for MDRTB, and the expected cohort is around 6,000 patients. So all of these countries that are planning to introduce BPAL under the operational research that I mentioned, Ukraine, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, 
are those countries who are currently the part of the regional operation research for modified shorter treatment regimens for MDR TB. So we as WHO Euro, and I would say that on behalf of our organization, we encourage the harmonization of data collection and to ensure the good quality data. So it is because we provide support to countries on this operational research for MDR TB, and that experience is we are planning to leverage. We particularly support the harmonization of data collection of forms and database and the use of the database so that we also are um, encouraging the good clinical care and that patient safety is ensured throughout the implementation. So that is why that experience that we have for the operational research on MSDR for MDR TB can be leveraged to the, uh, to the operational research on BPAL regimen. So um, with that, I, I would say on behalf of our region that we are welcome the introduction and we will be happy to support uh, from our side uh, to the ma maximum possible extent. And that the, also I would want to mention that, that the countries can consider implementing the BPAL regimen and, and benefit from the uh, protocol that was developed by the Global TV program and TDR uh, called SHORE because the BPAL regimen is reflected there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive answer and really insightful. Really looking forward to how things move on that run. Um, my, my next question would be to Dr. Min. Um, engagement of the patient community with TB programs is still nowhere close to the levels in HIV. And I would like to ask you, what has been the experience in your country? You know, how active and collaborative have the communities been? And how can the community sort of help speed the implementation of new regimes? Because in the end, it's for the patients, right? Um, thank you very much for the question. And now we, we, we got the high treatment success rate of the MDR and TB in, in, in 80% in the engagement. We got of the community-based TB care in our system. If the patient have in, in the, the community, there are our PT staff have go to the, 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 the patient house for daily. And then also it is the, 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 the enforced by the community volunteer. Also community volunteers have to watch out for the, this patient to do toss directly for the nation, directly, directly the daily. That, that, that is the principle of the, our treatment. The community based MDRDBK was established in here. We are training, giving the training to the community volunteer on to conduct the directly of the treatment of patients. And they are having to go to the patient house daily. It was supported by the, the, the global fund and SS3 fund for the patient support and the nutrition support. And then the, the trip travel allowance for the community volunteer. Although these are the, also are the involved in the community based TV care. Now we are searching of the kind of the treatment necessary and by the directly observed treatment and, and, and ensure for the daily dose. And they also the community volunteer have to support the, the infection control, health education, also the instruction for the, the, the our MDR division in their one or the region. That is the, the that is the our work, working doing on the, the community base and the MDR. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Min. And with that answer, unfortunately due to time, I would like to bring the QA section to an end. Firstly, I would like to thank all our speakers for providing us with their valuable time and insights. And of course, to all of you who attended this session for your time and interest. Um, the recording of today's event will be made available on www.tballiance.org, so you can view it later. And I would like to wrap this session up by saying what I think is right is that I firmly believe that, you know, if we are capable, we are responsible. And I hope today's session brings back the spotlight on why we need to come together and work towards, you know, getting the best treatments to the patients at the earliest. The patients need us now more than ever, and it is time for us to take up this responsibility collectively. Thank you once again, everyone, and stay safe.